Right. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to another uh, weekly Facebook live chat uh, from Rain, the Rain Network. Uh, today with me uh, is Matthew Bay, uh, one of our senior global uh, analysts, and we are going to be talking about a topic near and dear to both of our hearts: the uh, the U.S. Saudi relationship, which has been getting an awful lot of press recently uh, because of the, the the invasion of Ukraine has caused an energy spike, and and uh, Saudi Arabia is often looked at as a partner for the United States to uh, to, to help alleviate that for the Americans. But um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I guess Matthew, you have you got any uh, uh, quick reactions to some of this media coverage that we've got out there of people saying? Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, yeah. I think what we both have written on and, and have spoken on, you know, a number of times, um, the idea that the U.S. and Saudi Arabian relationship is kind of you know diverging and has been for a while. It's not new. Um, and I think we're really seeing, you know, clear, you know, that being, you know, put it clearly on display right now. Um, and I don't think that we should anticipate, you know, for example, um, even if, you know, three years from now, let's say Donald Trump is reelected the U.S. president, we might see, you know, a closer relationship or at least, you know, improvement of that relationship like we saw during the Trump administration. But by no means does that mean that the 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 gap between the two are going to close, because even during the Trump administration, um, Saudi Arabia got a lot closer to Russia and a lot closer to China. Right. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that irks me about some of this media coverage is that it's really personality based mm -hmm. and people talking about Mohammed bin Salman, him apparently yelling at Jake Sullivan about mentioning Khashoggi. There's moments like that. And in a monarchy, yeah, personalities can have an outsized effect on rhetoric and, and sometimes policy. But we talk about the strategic drivers of, of this and it goes much deeper than just Mohammed bin Salman loving Trump and hating Biden. I mean, a good example of that is how, you know, um, how Saudi Arabia has been cooperating with with uh, China on like ballistic missiles and things like that for decades at this point. It was something that happened in the 1980s to start with. Um, so this is, you know, if you are Saudi Arabia and you are looking at a world now where um, U.S. Uh, global power, not really receding, I guess it would probably be the wrong way to put it. But, you know, it's no longer the only sole superpower like it was, you know, from 19 uh, early 1990s until the last couple of years, China is rising as a, you know, competitor to that. Is it the same scale scope? And of course not. Uh, but given the fact that, you know, China's economic relationship with Saudi Arabia is much deeper than, you know, Saudi Arabia's economic relationship with the U.S., um, obviously Saudi Arabia is going to gravitate towards, you know, trying to, to balance between the two. And because the U.S. is so hesitant around things like um, ballistic missile knowledge transfer, um, you know, things like that because of human rights concerns, proliferation concerns, all those kinds of things. China doesn't have those same concerns. Why wouldn't Riyadh do it? Right. And this, at the same time, we're not looking at a Cold War scenario. We're looking at Saudi Arabia being out for itself and what it, what it's out for itself will sometimes align with Chinese uh, interests, sometimes align with American interests. And the more independence that Saudi Arabia can have from both of them is sort of Riyadh's long term goal, uh, regardless of what Mohammed bin Salman thinks personally of those leaders. Yeah. And another thing that's kind of been irking me about the kind of, you know, media coverage about this is how, um, at least in the U.S., you know, the U.S. political system is so hypersensitive around gasoline prices and blaming, um, you know, President Biden for that. Of course, largely not under his control, as I think you and I uh, both know. Uh, but there is criticism that, you know, the poor relationship with Saudi Arabia um, has, you know, led Saudi Arabia to not be willing to um, increase uh, oil production to offset some of the loss from Russia. But, I think what's you know we have to recognize is that even with a better relationship, Saudi Arabia has all their own reasons to continue this strategy. Um, for one, not only are they somewhat closer to Saudi or to Russia, um, but for one, if they were to increase production, it would break apart the OPEC Plus agreement, which they don't really want to do. Um, two, um, let's also just not realize that or, or not forget the fact that they are you know making all kinds of money after you know essentially being not making a lot of money from oil for, you know, an extended period of time, you know, five years, um, they are trying to refill the coffers. This is great for them. And because, you know, Western uh, production, like U.S. shale production, um, isn't really responding to the same degree or quick enough to actually replace Russian oil that's being taken off the market. I mean, why would Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, uh, increase production? It seems like they have little incentive to, even regardless of if, if it's the Biden administration or whomever. Um, I mean, if, I guess if President Trump was in power, maybe he would do another threat around, you know, defense or something like that. Um, but even that now in the context of the conflict would be kind of weird. Um, so I'm not even sure Trump would do that, which is, you know, saying something. 
Right, exactly. And and there's also the it, lurking in the back of Saudi Arabia's uh, policies is that the energy transition is happening. And, and you know, the, and, and to a certain extent, the Ukraine invasion is creating stronger incentives to try to make that happen. And when that day comes where we see peak oil demand, Saudi Arabia is is its finances will have to adapt. And this could be maybe not the last time that they have a, a massive windfall by le- like this, but they certainly can't avoid, uh, you know, they can't say, well, we'll take one for the team because we like the president. Um, we'll undermine our long term interests because, you know, we have a good personal relationship. Yeah. Um, and then uh, let's kind of talk more regionally, I guess. I mean, how do you see uh, the U.S. Saudi or sorry, the U.S. relationship with other GCC countries also going well, you know, it's it's interesting because the Emiratis were the ones who helped tamper down a little bit of the energy shock with a single comment that helped calm the market a little bit. And, but they, didn't still, <laughs> exactly, they, didn't, and then they didn't actually follow through on with that comment. Um, but they um, they it, it, there's a lot of that strain with uh, the United States and these other Gulf Arabs like um, the United Arab Emirates. that are also looking at the United States and saying. This isn't the partner that we thought you were. You know, after 1991, the U.S. rolled in and liberated Kuwait, and there was an assumption in these these royal circles that the U.S. would be willing to do something similar, if not the exact same thing, for many of their security threats. And now we've seen Houthis striking the Emirates. We've seen the the United States not backing them in the Qatar blockade. We saw the sign the Iran deal that they didn't like. So they're all seeing this sort of situation with the United States. It's looking out for its own interests. It can't be everywhere at once. It doesn't want to be everywhere at once. And they're trying to find ways to adapt as well. Um, but it is interesting, of course, the Qataris seem to be quite pleased with this world, um, that, they're, that, the, that the United States is not picking and choosing sides, letting these countries kind of um, not be, you know, twist in the wind when they can't follow through on their own policies. I think that's working out a bit for Doha. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that's really, I guess, not too surprising is how the Biden administration, while you mentioned how they're not getting a ton of you know, defensive support um, for, you know, protecting against the Houthi strikes. Um, hypothetically, let's say that continues to, to worsen. I mean, this year we've seen, you know, an expansion of attacks, you know, targeting Abu Dhabi, uh, things like that we hadn't seen in the past. Um, so let's say that those tactics are continuing to evolve. Where do you think the U.S. would be able to increase, you know, um, some support or would the U.S. increase some support? Yeah, no, that's good, good, good because it can feel fatalistic, right? right? Like the U.S. is leaving and won't come back. And we've explored that idea in some of our scenario building. What could bring the U.S. back? So let's say a Houthi missile strike hits something in Dubai or Abu Dhabi and there's significant Western casualties, especially Americans. That would bring the U.S. back. An attack on a U.S. air base, which we know they've done. Uh, in Abu Dhabi, but we also know that those missiles were intercepted. And, and so as a result, the U.S. didn't feel the need to retaliate. But one of those got through. That would cause a, a, a change in U.S. posture. So there are certainly ways the U.S. can get drawn back in. But I think it has to be something that results in an accident, uh, like an accidental escalation. The Houthis are aware that they don't want to bring the United States into their conflict. So if they're firing a missile at, at the UAE or at Saudi Arabia, they're aiming at things where they're, they're calculating that's not going to cause an escalation with a Western power like the U.S. Uh, but it's still well within the realm of possibility. You're firing a missile. You can't always guarantee you're going to hit the, the target that you intend. Yeah, the other thing that I think could draw the U.S. back in is if, as nuclear negotiations with Iran have basically been frozen, you know, for the last week or sorry, not week, like a month, because um, the U.S. is not willing to remove the uh, FTO designation from from the IRGC. Um, that is something if that becomes a more of a crisis, you know, where Iran takes more steps towards it, maybe building a nuclear weapon as a nuclear test, reduces enrichment to 90 percent. Obviously, that could serve more U.S. Um, I guess it would have to balance what it's doing between you know, the, the active war in, in Russia, I guess, which is not going to be, or sorry, active war in Ukraine, which is not going to be ending anytime soon um, with what it does on Iran. But that is a crisis if we ever get to that point. And if the U.S. has to be in crisis mode to contain Iran because of a growing nuclear program, the only launching point for the U.S. is in the GCC, Saudi Arabia being a part of that. Exactly. And there's also, of course, the potential that uh, the jihadist terrorism resurges. We don't see that as a high probability right now. But, they're, they, you know, ISIS-K in Afghanistan is active. ISIS has not been completely wiped out and the ideology is still there. So there's always the chance that, that some sort of small scale operation or a lone wolf operation causes significant casualties in the United States or in a key ally killing Westerners. And that draws the U.S. back in. After all, no, nobody really foresaw ISIS happening after the U.S. withdrawal of 2011. And then a few years later, the United States was back into Iraq, um, not really intending to be there. So another thing that I've been thinking about, and this goes back to what we kind of started off talking about a little bit earlier, which was, you know, Mohammed bin Salman having, you know, a ton of power within Saudi Arabia, obviously. Um, and then a lot of his policies, at least initially, being kind of, you know, um, chaotic. I know when we were writing on this subject, you know, when he was trying to consolidate power, uh, become a crown, a crown prince, etc., um, we were talking about, you know, 
adventurism in Saudi Arabia or sorry in Yemen probably maybe going a little weird. We saw the Khashoggi incidents maybe being a, a little outlandish reaction. There was the kidnapping of the Lebanese prime minister, however you want to call it. Then there was all the Ritz, you know, crackdowns and things like that. Um, we haven't really seen those kinds of outbursts of, of weird policy making from MBS in recent years. Do you think we are actually seeing a little bit more moderated versions of him? Still very aggressive, still trying to drive, you know, his Saudi policies. Um, and still to actually, you know, and somewhat combative to the U.S. like over oil. But are we seeing, you know, him coming of age in terms of being able to actually learn how to lead the country? And if so, um, how do you think that shapes um, U.S. posture towards him? Because I know a lot of people were looking at, you know, those first few week or years of, of MBS, you know, really consolidating power, saying the U.S. has to figure out how to control him. Um, are we really in that dynamic anymore? Yeah, and I think it's an interesting question. It's always hard, of course, to analyze the personalities behind the black box that is the Saudi royal palace. But what we can say is output wise, we're not seeing those erratic policies anymore. It, it, they stopped in the latter half of the Trump administration um, and then especially after the Khashoggi incident, um, the assassination. So that, that was one big one where I, I think that the the. Mohammed bin Salman and his inner circle of advisors decided that they would take fewer risks after that, because that was really that was a massive uh, of incident. And it still sticks to his reputation to this day. Um, but the, the question is, has he learned his lessons permanently? Will he revert to tight? If there is a second Trump term, I think it's an open question. Um, if the United States, for example, you know, uh, acts like it's less of a reliable partner, could that cause Saudi Arabia to take greater risks in hopes of bolstering its own security? Could they try to test U.S. sanctions by buying Chinese kit or Russian military kit uh, in an attempt to, you know, to, to diversify their defense strategy? Those sorts of things, I think, could happen. And, and, and maybe Mohammed bin Salman has matured behind the scenes, although we've got some Wall Street Journal reporting again about yelling at the, you know, the, the national security director or national security head um, that suggests that his personality is probably still intact. Um, and he is a royal figure. There's not a lot of checks on him uh, to, to tell him you need to do not behave this way. Um, so I don't think we can rule it out that, that that he could go back to this kind of black sheep behavior at any time, especially and most importantly, when King Salman finally passes on. He is an old king. Um, once he's gone, that'll be the last major institutional check on Mohammed bin Salman. And maybe some of these things that is riskier are not necessarily a net negative. You know, there's lots of reporting that he's in favor of normalizing with Israel. That's a very big taboo in Saudi society. But he may decide to push past that and just ignore uh, that domestic outcry. Uh, because he decides he sees value in it uh, once King Salman has passed on. Yeah, the other thing I think, and I know we've kind of started off the conversation about this, but the other thing just to think about is um, no matter what, you know, even as we go undergo the energy transition, Saudi Arabia's most important economic, you know, relationship will always and probably remain at least be with uh, with China, um, like it has been for the last couple of years. Um, it's never going to go back to that economic relationship with the U.S. that it once had. Um, right. I think that's something that is just going to be happening no matter what. And that is going to drive MBS if he does go back to some of those, uh, you know, more, I guess you want to call it erratic behaviors or whatnot. Um, that is something that's going to give him, enable him to do that. Um, China will be far and willing to sell, you know, all kinds of arms to Saudi Arabia, et cetera, that the U.S. would not be willing to do. Um, and given the fact that we expect U.S. and China relations to, you know, continue to be uh, very antagonistic and growingly antagonistic over the next decade or decades at this point, um, it wouldn't be shocking, for example, to see um, legislation similar to the Katsa sanctions on, on Russia um, being expanded to, to, incre to uh, include broader kinds of sales and military agreements with China. And that is something that would very immediately, you know, touch sanctions. Because I mean, we've even seen, even the Trump administration um, was very vocal about, you know, not being a, you know anti-China, even though uh, with U.S. allies, the Trump administration was very aggressive, as you we know in Israel about the port that was being developed by an Israeli company. They also did similar things in in the UAE. So even if the Trump administration comes back into power, um, we would probably still see that anti-China element of it, also still remaining a constant thorn in the issue of uh, U.S. Saudi relations. Right. And another pr problem for the Saudis going forward is that, you know, in, in the 60, 70 years ago, Britain withdrew from the region and the U.S. replaced it. Well, if the U.S. is drawing down, China isn't going to replace it in the same way. We're not we're not seeing a, a Chinese shift to deploying bases that are supposed to balance power in the Middle East. Um, that doesn't seem to be in the cards. So if the United States is pulling back and there are areas where there's a power vacuum, Saudi Arabia has to fill it itself. And I, I think that's also something that we'll have to keep looking for. And how does Mohammed bin Salman interpret that? And how does he decide to uh, implement policies to fill those? And what kind of mistakes might he make along the way?
Yeah, and it's not like China doesn't have a very decent, a very good relationship with Tehran either. They have a 20-year strategic agreement. Obviously, it's probably less strategic than what the name of it says. Um, but at the same time, it's not as if you know Saudi Arabia or, or China is looking at you know its relationship with Saudi Arabia and thinking of that as being you know a need to contain Iran or anything like Iran and really anything to do with Iran. It's more about oil transactionism, all these kinds of things. Um, and so that means that if you're Saudi Arabia and you are seeing potentially a U.S. nuclear deal at some point, maybe, or in the worst case scenario for for for, for Saudi Arabia a no deal but a nuclear state of iran um saudi arabia is going to be dealing with all kinds of things about you know how to contain that and react to that right and, and then they will be increasingly on their own if that scenario does come to come to pass all right well um there's a very interesting conversation touching on a lot of issues certainly yeah. on everybody's mind um and um yeah matthew thank you so much for joining me this friday of course